Hi everyone, it's me. And I know I haven't filled my face in a super long time. I got you. I get it. And I personally don't like this lamp being in the frame either, but considering how small this space is, I don't exactly have a choice in the matter. I thought for a couple minutes long and hard if I even should be recording with my face on, and there's never going to be a good moment, so I'm just gonna shoot my shot, go n no script, but I have an outline, so I don't go too off track. I wanted to make this video because I found a very interesting comment on a YouTube short that I was watching that I was going to ignore the YouTube short altogether because it was sort of made out of context to what the YouTuber or who the YouTuber was quoting from exactly, but the comment that was made on the video caught my attention and I think it sums up perfectly the, um, starting point of what I'm trying to say here. And by the way, I'm not gonna post a screenshot of this quote. I just don't want to expose them to the wrong kind of attention, but I will um, basically say what it said. Quote, idols should always work their hardest no matter what, end quote, until their hardest isn't good enough and they get hate for it. This idol always tries their hardest and it's never good enough, they always get hate. Even back in my day, Nobody really spoke about celebrities either doing not exactly badly. Like, I don't want to use that word. I don't, I don't want to use badly because that's not always true. But let's just say a certain, I'm going to talk more so talk about stage performers. So singers, dancers, like idols, stuff like that, because this is what it mostly applies to. Like a performer, or not every performer is going to even meet like the basic bar of like performing expectations. What this person is trying to say is even if they don't like meet to the satisfactory bar, they're gonna get hate for it. I wouldn't say that hate is the word that people are gonna use to describe this. It's more like if they don't meet that basic bar of what they should be capable of doing, it's going to get called out more. And I've noticed that with especially a lot of K-pop idols, because that's where all the teen spaces are going to right now. A lot of people are trying to put in their criticism on certain skill sets and stuff like that. And a lot of people, people bleh, are obscuring it as hate because they probably see one random hate comment out of like what thousands upon thousands of I love you's and um they're doing great comments in there or even like thousands and thousands of maybe critique comments in there that are actually criticism and whether they explicitly say I don't hate this person or even though I'm not a fan of them I respect them I'm just giving my two cents here which everyone is allowed to do they're going to see that one person who says something really nasty because either A, they feel like it, B, they're a troll, or C, they can't like control themselves or whatever the reasoning is. Like at this point, I don't care. I think what a lot of, especially like K-pop listeners, like fans, what they really don't understand about like, like this is exactly what happens when their niche of a, music like community or music like genre section enters mainstream international viewing because all of a sudden like they're like oh i wish other people would see this too but in reality no they kind of don't because then when you get the normal people looking at what you like through a more um wide lens in terms of what they're exposed to and even if they're a person who likes all music and even though they know all the general basis of certain genres and what they should consist of, of course they do the research and of course, like soon as they get enough experience listening to your genre, they're gonna look back at these examples that you showed them maybe, or they're gonna look at like something else that something's really popular right now. They're gonna look at it and be like, okay, maybe it's not exactly up to where they should be and it's always, it, or a majority of the time, 
it's not that idol's fault. It's probably some outside thing. Or maybe sometimes it is the idol's fault and you can just tell that the person is like not there or they just don't care about that said thing. And they would give like their honest feedback on it. But then when the fan receives that honest feedback or they don't receive it exactly, but they see that honest feedback from a person who's like, they're not talking to anybody specific. They're just letting their opinions out there. They're like, they're trying their hardest. Like, what can you do? Like, can you do anything like this? And from my personal experience, no, I can't do what these idols do on a daily basis, but do I know what it's supposed to look like based on like watching and listening experience? Yes, yes I do. And if I know, if I feel that, or if I see that something is not right, it means that something is not right. And back to what I've been trying to get at, it's the, the fans are like, they're trying, they're trying, they're trying, but it seems like they're never good enough for everyone's eyes. And you know what? Sometimes people out there, they can try and try and try to do something that maybe they're not good at compared to other skills that they have. It's like trying to put a square peg into a round hole. Like you can shave up the edges and make it round, but that doesn't mean that it's going to slide in perfectly. It's going to struggle to slide in there. Like you can smash that damn square peg into that round hole as much as you want. But at the end of the day, it's not gonna go in there easily. In fact, it might go through, but it's gonna go through very hurt and they're gonna be very misshapen by the time it comes back out the other side. And that is not a good thing. It's not a good thing to try to pressure some person to fit into a mold that they're not gonna fit in. And yes, it's true that it's like they're gonna try their hardest to, and apparently it's not good enough. But what we have to realize is that if they don't fit into that mold, that's perfectly okay. It's not the end of that person's life. It is not the end of that person's world. Like if you just admit that there's some things that you're not good at, they should be focusing on things that they are good at. That's why like um, idols, like even back in the old days, they had a certain role to fit. Like some people were better at singing. So they were more in the forefront. Some people were better at dancing. So when they had like a dance focused scene, they would bring, they would bring them out more to the forefront. That's why people who have, well, I already have my gripe with K-rap, but if someone had a more appealing like rap line or something like that, they would have their moment to shine. That's why these roles exist. And that's why like, yeah, I agree with some people. Like the fact that now K-pop companies are too lazy to like help people train in the specific thing that they're good at they're just going to throw every single lesson they had at them for like, I don't know, 10, to a, 10 months to a year. And it's all right. Okay, you have this time. And if you're like still not good at the things that you're not good at, well, sucks for you. Because you have to perform it at the front anyway. Like that does more harm to that person than it does good. At the end of the day, this is going to sound like the harshest part of the criticism that I have for this video. If that person is not good at one part of the performing aspect in the K-pop idol scene, whether that's singing, dancing, rapping, whatever, they should not be doing that. Like there are many K-pops who have gone solo and you might've noticed that some of these idols, either they're more singing focused. So when they perform on a stage, they're gonna be more focusing on their vocal talent and getting the words out there for the audience to hear while some soloists are more dance focused. So they have more dance oriented music. So by the time that dance break comes in, they can show off what they can do. And you know what? That's perfectly fine. As long as they're making good music that expresses what they're good at. I think that's what anyone could ask for. And maybe there are certain people who are in this industry who like, maybe they can't do any of those things. And you know what? That's okay too. And there have been trainees who competed on survival shows where 
they didn't get to be in a group or get to the final end of the finish line. And some of them, they continue their training. And others, they would just go to a normal life and they focus on something else that they really enjoy. Whether that's streaming, whether that's running their own business, finishing their education, and going into a career that they've always found interesting. There is nothing wrong with that. As long as they are happy and living their best life, I think that's all everyone can ask for. But then there's some delusional side of things where it's like, especially I think with the more mainstream company groups, like big three, big four, I don't know which number it is anymore because people keep debating about it. But even with those groups, it's like they have an expectation that even with the little that they're given or the little training that these idols want to continue going through because I forget which idol who said this. It's I know it's second gen. I know she's a second gen person. She said, like, your training does not end at debut. Like, it's expected that if you want to take this musical thing seriously, you have to get better while you're doing the job. Because if you're not getting better while you're doing the job, why are you still doing the job? And it's true. Like, if you want to continue working this job because you know you could be the person that you can be, why not, like, take a extra time to work on the things that maybe could use some improvement? There is nothing wrong doing that. But it seems like, especially since we ventured the fourth gen of the K-pop sphere, it's like, extra training? For what? Like, I already debuted after, I don't know, five months of doing X, Y, and Z, so that means I'm ready. No, that's not what it means. That's literally not what it means. The, the months of training are supposed to prepare you for when you go up on stage and people are looking at you. Because, I mean, yes, there are pre-debut content where it's introducing the group and stuff like that. But that's for marketing purposes only. That's for the audience to say, oh, there's this group coming in and they have stuff to show you. So you would be impressed. And if they're not impressed by what you have to offer at debut, that is not good. You have to make a promise at debut. It's like, yeah, I know I still have to improve on things, but I promise you when we release more music and perform for you more, it's going to get better. If they get better, that's the greatest thing that the fans can engage in because that means the artists, company, group, whatever, they kept their promise that okay, it's like, okay, the debut was a little rough, but now we have more that we promise we'll knock your socks off later. And I've seen groups that done that. Like, look at NMIX, for example. Like, their debut was complete ass. Though, to be fair, it was not the girls' fault. It was basically the company screwing over. But with NMIX continuing with every song that came out afterwards, they were able to show what skills they had to offer more. That, that's how I became a fan of NMIX. Like, yes, OO is still shit but their other songs are a mass improvement compared to their debut. So I don't see a problem with becoming fans of them afterwards, as long as they were able to keep their promise that, okay, we do have music that means something. So when people are saying like, oh, this idol like keeps getting critiqued on, maybe because um, she's not dancing well on stage compared to everyone else, it's like, She's trained for so long. First, like, here's the thing about dancing. I've danced for a couple of years and I'm not an expert on it, obviously, because I'm not those crazy people who have been dancing since they were like two. Basically, what I'm trying to say is even for me, even though I can perform pretty much the basics, I would never be able to do like what celebrity performers do every single concert that they perform. I know I won't be able to do that. Unless I've been training for, like, literal years. Like, because dance is a sport. Like, you're not going to perfect a sport in a month. That's not how it works. Like, if you want to partake in something that athletical, or if you want to get into an instrument, like, singing, like, trumpet, violin, piano, drums, something like that, whether it's athletics or practicing an art, it's not going to take you a month to be able to like perform basics from scratch to then be a full on blown expert on it. That's why like a lot of singers, especially in the West, like they've been doing music long before 
they get to that point that where they debut to be in the limelight. Like they've been been dedicated to their musical craft for so long that by the time they get there, they want to show the audience, this is what I can do. And I can do more if you let me. And now I'm not saying that, oh, it's like every person who becomes a K-pop idol, it's st they start as a complete like newbie. Like they don't care about music at all. Maybe like the 1%, like one or 2% do like they go into this industry like expecting nothing and i mean that's how they come out like also like expecting the audience nothing because like if they don't care about music why the hell should you there are people like a lot of people want to be in this industry because they have a passion for music dance in some form or some way um i'm trying to remember which one it is it might be giselle actually if it's not, I could be perfectly wrong. Like, I remember I was researching these girls when they first debuted. One of them was actually in her school choir. And that told me, oh, okay, so she's had plenty of singing experience. That's how I know that she's got it good because choir is super competitive. Like, they don't let just anybody do choir. Okay, that part's not true because um, we had choir class in school and we had a lot of, like, screw up kids who thought, oh, singing's just an easy A. They just don't have to do anything. That's not true. First of all, choir is not an easy A. Like, you can't just be in class and do the bare minimum. You actually have to partake in concerts and you have to partake in singing lessons in the class. But basically, that tells me, okay, this member already has experience in the singing field. So if she got lesser training in the singing field at SM Entertainment because she already was doing vocal lessons or choir singing prior to that, that's understandable because not everyone needs like as much training if they had like the background experience of doing so. Like I think there was also a couple more idols, if I recall correctly, who also had like vocal lessons or they would also do like singing activities before they would go into auditions for each of these companies. And I think for the companies, that's a plus because if they want to do less training for these idols, they're like, okay, if if we want to do less training for them, then we need to look for people who have had experience at X, Y, and Z. And I do know, I think some idols would also like do like, what's it called? Like backstreet dancing or like um, dancing, like, like dance lessons outside of auditions and stuff like that. I'm like, hey, if you had training in dance prior to this, again, that's fine because that means not only do you know the basics, you also like are able to come up with maybe choreography by yourself, maybe at maybe at that, or you at least know how to do a little bit more of the difficult stuff. So when you go into training before debut, that would make choreographer's life so much easier. So yes, there is that, but I feel like in fourth gen, that's probably less and less so because in the minds of the companies, they wanna get more groups out as possible. More groups equals more money, more selling albums, more money. Depending on the background of each of the person, again, we don't know everything. We don't know everything about these people. We don't know what they did in terms of like their own education or like their own hobbies, we don't know. But then sometimes like you look at these um, idols and you can tell either they were just not meant to do the dancing thing. And sometimes like regardless of how much training this person has, sometimes dancing is not their calling. And that is fine because not everyone is meant to be like, I don't know any famous dancers at the top of my head. Like no one's meant to be like the grand dame ballerina or like the most spinning on your back, like backstreet dance in existence. Like no one expects that going in. But what they are expecting is that you at least are able to do like choreography that not even like beginner dancers can do. And sometimes, People, these idols don't even know how to do that. And I know there's also like voguing, some sort of voguing hand movements involved. Sometimes I look at idols doing that and they don't even know how to position their arms correctly. They don't even know like where the feet should go. And I'm like, how long did they have to perform or like practice this before they went on a like music bank stage or even at like a debut showcase? Like how long did they have to practice before this? And I know like I've heard that the training schedule or basically schedules for each comeback or debut is like very harsh over there. Sometimes so stupidly harsh that they have to condense everything and these people only get like 
hour, certain minimal hours of sleep, which is god awful, by the way. And I'm pretty sure that in the States, that's completely illegal. But case in point, even like, it's like people say, sometimes no matter how hard you try to be good at something, sometimes even if at the most pinnacle moment, the most pinnacle moment of this possible dream career that you're going to have, if it's not satisfying enough, it's just not satisfying enough. And that's not a bad thing. The movie that comes to mind when I think about this concept is actually, I don't know if everyone's seen this movie. It wouldn't surprise me if you don't, is Monsters University, which is the prequel to Monsters, Inc. that came out somewhat 10 years ago. Um, in this prequel movie, it's about, it's about when Mike and Sully meet in college, which already I think is wrong. I don't always like this movie because it kind of retcons everything that, or certain things that are discussed in the first movie, which I think is ridiculous, but I digress. So in this movie, ever since Mike was a kid, he was inspired to become a scarer at Monsters, Inc. Basically, if you know from the first movie, scarers are the monsters who go into the human world, they scare children, and they collect screams as energy for Monstropolis. So Mike is super obsessed with the whole concept of like the scarers, the scare celebrities. And he wants to be exactly like one. So throughout his childhood into when he starts college, he studies, he gets like involved, highly involved in the scare culture. He like his goal in mind is to be one of those famous scares that he um, admires. But then when he gets to school, when he gets to college to be in the scare program, which he's able to sign up to do and take classes, he realizes it's not as easy as he thought it would be. Because he is really good at studying and basically mastering like each of the scare techniques like on paper. But when it comes to applying them to actually um, do the deed of scaring children, like he has, he wasn't able to like um, do, like go through the actual human world because at the university you don't, don't, you don't do that yet. But when it turns to doing like simulator tests, he's not exactly the best at it. In fact, this is where Sully comes in. Like he's the son of the famous Sul Sullivan family and they're known to be the top scarers in the whole monster world. So of course Sully comes in, like he doesn't, really care all that much about studying on how to be a scarer. It's like, oh, because of my name, I find it super easy when, yes, he has the um, classic roar to do the job, but it doesn't always do the job because as the movie goes on, Mike gets better at studying scaring and his professor is impressed on how he gets the techniques down. But because Sully hasn't studied all that much and he continues doing his like one trick pony shtick, the professor becomes less and less impressed. And then there's a point in the film where I think, I don't know if it, I think it's an exam or something that comes up. And basically Mike and Sully are trying to outdo each other because at this, because when they first meet, they do not like each other at all. They like, Mike hates how Sully is a pompous, like frat boy wannabe. And Sully hates how much of a nerd Mike is. So they're trying to outdo each other by basically roaring at each other. And this becomes like such a big fight that I think she's the dean of the school. And she has like a prized um, canister of Scream like in this um, lecture hall. They basically knock over her canister and it basically gets destroyed in the Scrabble. And of course she's really fucking pissed about it because why wouldn't you? You destroyed school property right then and there. I mean, why I was in the lecture hall, I don't, will never understand. So basically she kicks Mike and Sully both out of the scare program as punishment. She tells Sully that he's basically a one trick pony and because he hasn't studied on what it is to be a scarer at all, he's ashamed of his family. And then she tells Mike that even though he knows the techniques and the basics, he's just not scary enough to apply them. And of course, this makes the both of them really mad. So they are kicked out of the scare program, but to basically get back into the scare program, the Greek life on Monsters University get into a competition and it's 
And it's like Mike and Sully are forced to join this um, outside, uni- like, um, not university, um, this outside fraternity called Uzma Kappa, who are basically a bunch of, like, nobodies who the school also deems them, like, not scary at all. And they don't look like your typical scary monsters either. And Mike is determined to help them also become scares because, again, Mike is, like, very good at studying and coaching side of things, while Sully is, like, not interested at all. Because basically when he got kicked out of the scare program, he also get, got kicked out of the first fraternity that he was in. So but, so the second part of the movie, the second third of the movie, is all about the Greek life competition. And with Mike and Sully finally, like, seeing eye to eye by this point, because at the beginning of the competition, it doesn't go well because they're not working together, but then they soon realize they sort of need each other to help this fraternity. So they finally start working together to basically beat all the other sororities and fraternities in the competition. But then it gets to the final part, the finale, where it's basically they get to, into the scare simulator and whoever gets the most points to scare everyone or to complete every scare in the simulator, whoever has the most points is the final winner. So, of course, um, the other members of the fraternities um, go first and they show off how much they improved and you see their high scores go up. But then you have Mike who does the finishing, the finisher last. And of course he's up against the uh, the rival fraternities, um, I guess president, leader, like gang leader or something. I don't know how to describe it. And while Mike is performing, he has the thoughts of the criticism that he thinks is hate is running through his head. And that makes Mike like more determined to basically finish the competition on top. So Mike does his scare. He ends up getting the most points out of everyone on the team. And everyone is cheering in, in like, um, surprise because they didn't think this lowly fraternity was actually going to improve on their scares that quickly. Everyone goes home, except, um, Uzma Kappa. They're actually still in the, the arena because Mike is, like, looking at the simulator like, oh my god, I actually did it. I actually did it. But then Sully, like, starts acting weird because, um, he starts like, okay, Mike, let's go, blah, blah, blah. And then, like, all of a sudden, like, Mike does one last boo as a joke at, like, the, um, the simulator kid because he doesn't think that a simple boo was gonna, like, make the machine move. But it actually does make the machine move. And it, um, yoinks up the score meter for Mike's voice on the scoreboard again. And Mike thinks... Wow, that's super weird. I didn't expect that to do anything. So then he like snaps his fingers at the machine again. And of course it causes the same result. So Mike opens up like this um, electric box that basically determines like the difficulty of the simulator. That's how it works. And he noticed that Mike, who was the sixth voice on the command box, he noticed that his got tampered. Which was not supposed to happen. Like, everyone else was set to the highest difficulty. But for Mike's, it was set on super easy. And you can tell that it was forced up there because someone had damaged it. And this is when Mike gets mad. Because he knows that Sully did something to basically make them cheat. But the weird thing is, Sully didn't do it to everyone else. Because everyone else's, including his, were on the super hard difficulty. Only Mike's was the one, basically, um yoinked up and ripped apart to the easy to the easy difficulty so that they would basically win of course again mike is pissed because it makes it sound like all the hard work that he put in was now a sham because how do you work so hard on something only to have someone basically like cheat the system for you to which sully makes a point by saying i'm not going to let the rest of the fraternity fall because you don't have the knack for scaring, which of course, again, pisses off Mike. Mike goes off running, and of course the other fraternity finds out about this, because, like I said, they stayed back for reasons that I can't explain. I guess it was to, like, um, bask in the glory, I guess. The rest of the fraternity finds out they are not happy about this either, even though they're the, not the ones that got cheated out. It was, again, it was only Mike's um, options who got screwed up for the competition. And they look at Sully, they're like... You bastard. 
So of course, Sully is off to tell the Dean his misdeeds, of course. But while that's happening, while Mike is, of course, still mad, he steals a, like a student's ID to basically break into the, what I can only describe is the doors department of the of the campus which basically houses like the classes where you actually make the doors that go into the human world like again i don't know how much that works that's just how, what i'm describing in this movie but of course by doing that the alarm goes off like the kids the students are running to the doors department when someone someone tells the dean like someone had broken in already sully already knows who it is and he's like oh my god no so, of course, the students who are already in the dorms department, doors department, I don't mean dorms, doors department, they watch Mike go into the human world, even though he's not supposed to, this is actually breaking all the protocol rules, but Mike's point is that if he thinks he can scare humans, like, out in the human world, then he would prove everyone else wrong, that he, that Mike was ready to do this, like, he had prepared for this moment all his life, and he's not going to let a cheat determine otherwise. However, what, what this does, because the door goes into a camping cabin in the woods, it doesn't really determine, like, where this camp is, but I think you can tell it's somewhere in the United States. Like, it's out in the woods, it's a children's camp, Mike sneaks into the ca cabin, and he tries to do the technique that he did, like, during the competition to scare the kid, but then reality hits him like a truck when he does the scare, because instead of this child like acting scared or crying or anything the child actually mistakes mike for an alien and says like how funny and cool mike looks and then all the kids other kids wake up and they're like oh my god like it's an alien how cool to which that's not the reaction that mike was looking for mike panics and he breaks out of the cabin to run into the woods because all of a sudden of course the camp counselors are going to call the police saying, like, there's an animal running amok on, on, like, the camp. Because, as you know from Monsters, Inc., the human world is not supposed to know that monsters exist. Or else, like, the monster will, will, will be in, like, full disaster. Again, I don't know how this works, and the series doesn't really describe it better either. So, everyone else arrives at the department, and the door... The door is completely blocked off because there's an investigation going on. But basically, Sully, who's now scared for Mike's safety, runs into the door and basically, like, avoids police notification, like, detection. Much to his fright, because at first, Sully was terrified to go into the human world. Again, I think this is all in, like, his show of, like, oh, I'm from, like, the Sullivan family, I'm the top scare. But when he actually goes in to, like, do the deed, he's not ready. He's not prepared at all. It comes back to that. But then he eventually finds Mike at the lake and tries to convince Mike, we need to get out of here. You're in big trouble. We're both in big trouble now that I'm here. We should get out of here. But then throughout the whole time, Mike is like contemplating to himself, like, I prepared this moment all my life. Like, I did everything right. I did everything I was supposed to do. But when I actually did it, they looked at me like I was a freak. Like, they looked at me, and they weren't even scared. And of course, Sully is already written with guilt because, one, he knew this was going to happen, and two, like, he wasn't fully honest with Mike about this. And at the same time, he didn't want it, this to infect the, or affect the competition either. So the fact that he first lied to Mike, and then, like, he wasn't full out honest with him, as a friend, at that standpoint, Sully knows this is all his fault, that he basically riled Mike up to do this. And the moment I looked at that scene, I think that reminds me of, like, how these fans are riling up, like, idols as if they're, like, friends of, like, oh, if you set your mind to something, you can do anything. While part of that is true, if you work really hard on the talents that you are good at, then... There's a possibility that those talents are going to go unnoticed and people are going to see your worth in that. However, if you hype up people on the certain things that maybe they can use improvement on, whether they are ready or maybe who knows, maybe they're never ready. It happens. It happens because we are human and certain people are designed to do different things. 
that's not a problem. But if you keep hyping them up saying, oh, what is subpar or just plain average is like the best thing they've ever seen, you're hyping up this person to think maybe they are the best. And I get, in celebrity culture, I get it. Everyone's in competition to be the best. And if it's like a fake it till you make it type of game. But it's a fake it till you make it type of game that could end up like lifting someone or it could destroy you at the very end of the day. And a lot of times this game destroys more than it does bring up people, if you know what I'm saying. So there is a quote that I found like a month or so ago from an old like set of pictures from the Magic School Bus. And it's Miss Frizzle saying, if at first you don't succeed, find out why. And I prefer this over, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Because even though it doesn't imply it, try, try again sounds like, um, oh, if you know at first don't do this thing correctly that you want to do, keep practicing and maybe you'll get better. And sometimes it does work. However, I think what they need to include in that is like if you're trying to solve a problem and the solution that you have doesn't work and you can very clearly see that it didn't work like there needs to be a reason why it didn't work like there needs to be a reason why like the thing isn't doing the thing by saying find out why it requires you to think and look at you as the person or maybe it's the object that you have and you're trying to figure out why, like, why is it not asking to do, or why is it not doing what I want it to do? And yes, it's going to require thinking. And sometimes I know people don't like thinking. And I think that's the problem. A lot of the time, people just don't like thinking about a lot of things. Because if they just want to, like, lay back and enjoy something, they have all the right to do so. And they have all the right to do so with like without someone nagging in their ear telling them that they shouldn't enjoy the thing. But the thing is, if someone is trying to accomplish, like I said, something as artistic as being in the music industry is, if the vocals are not vocaling and your dancing is not as fluent as it should be, you need to figure out why it's not doing what it's doing and once you figure out why the reason exists or what the solid reason is you have two options to like um then tackle the problem again that's one coming up with a solution a different kind of solution that might or might not fix the problem, but at least it's a different solution that you're trying. And who knows, there is a possibility that it'll be a success rate next time. The second thing you could do is basically completely ignore the reason why, because you might think it's stupid or whatever reason that you might think of. And you're basically going to repeat the same choice over and over again. And you're still going to see that the solution is not solutioning until you realize, okay, what I'm doing is not working. Something else needs to be done here because clearly I'm doing something wrong. And I get it. Most people don't like to do extra thinking because it's not about it being extra work. It's that we as humans, um, we are people who like, or we are creatures that we like getting things done the first time around, we don't want to do extra work unless it's completely necessary. And from a young age, because I'm speaking from my own experience here, from a young age, when you especially like get into um, higher levels of school where it's more like logic based learning than it is creative learning. Like you're going to get told by teachers a lot of times that an answer is going to be wrong. Like, it's going to happen to you eventually. And I remember it happening to me for the first time. Like, it completely blew my mind. Because I'm like, I was doing so well before. I was always praised by everyone I knew. So, what is it that I'm doing wrong? For some people, like, when they do a thing, especially when, when you're in school, there's always going to be, like, that one subject or that, like, 
one thing elective in class that you just hate because you've been told plenty of times that you're just not good at it or like you always get like criticism for um doing something incorrectly with the assignment that you're doing for me that's always been writing essays well i was always the first per person to admit to myself that i suck at essays i've always apparently according to teachers i've always written them wrong like the topic either, either wasn't good enough or it was just um I could have, I'm missing something. It was always a different reason, no matter like what criticism I applied to the essay. It was I like, I like, I think the only times that I've received A's in writing essays, even though I am an English major, I was an English major in college. The only time that I've written A's was in my like, I call it the Magic Kingdom writing class. It was basically a writing class. I took my first semester ever in college, my freshman year. And it was basically you wrote essays literally about Disney movies, applying them to the real world. Because I was so good at Disney knowledge, for some reason, those were the only good essays that I could write. But again, that's an anomaly. Because then I had to write essays about other topics and it was either B's or even C's writing those essays. So every time like, I was in my English class and a, a like um, essay assignment came up, in my head, I would do the eternal groan because I knew how this was going to end up. And I know, like, I know it sounds like self-deprecating because, oh, hey, I'm a YouTuber. It's like kind of required that I do essays in video format. And I'll admit to you that I know that sometimes my videos are not always that great either. And how do I know? Because sometimes I'll watch them later and I'll just be like, oh my god, why did I write it? the script like this? And, and hell, there are just some videos on this platform that I straight up regret. But I keep them up anyway for people's entertainment because maybe I get some enjoyment at people poking fun of the things I said wrong. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. That's true. That's true. But you know what else it does? Because with every not so positive comment that I get, even ones that are like straight up not useful. And you know, the not useful comments that I'm talking about. Even though it's not straight up useful, I can always find something in a negative comment that maybe if I thought about it hard enough, I'd be like, hmm, they do have a point in this because maybe I noticed it myself. And what I would do is I, I would apply that tiny, teeny bit of advice into my future videos. Because I know that people won't enjoy my content until I start improving them bit by bit. And I know about topic, like not everyone's going to like the topic I discuss. I really can't control that. As you get older, yes, those cri like critic comments are going to suck. Like, at least getting them, the getting them process is going to suck. Because we as humans, we like to try our hardest at everything. And, but we also have to realize that sometimes, without, like, the proper, um, techniques or, like, the proper tools that we maybe should have gotten earlier, but who knows, even without those, Sometimes just doing our hardest, no matter how hard you study, no matter how hard you practice, no matter like how much you go into like the industry or a topic or a hobby that you really, really like, sometimes it's just not going to happen. And it's going to be very depressing when you hit that moment of how you realize maybe it's not going to happen. But let me tell you the ending to Monsters University for a second. So after Mike and Sully reconcile at the lake, Mike agrees to come home with Sully. But that was when they realized that in the Monsters University, they had shut down the door for the investigation portion. And they're trying to open the door to, in the human world to escape and it's not working. So Mike comes up with a plan that if we can't open it 
from the outside, then maybe we can have screams occur from the outside. Sully thinks this is a very risky, like, it's not going to work idea, but but Sully also knows that Mike is really good at the technicals. So Sully decides to finally trust Mike in this moment since he didn't he made the mistake of not trusting Mike before. So of course the sheriffs or the cops come into the cabin after Mike basically screwed up the scare routine the first time. And Mike and Sully put their plan in action. S Mike does all of the like scraping noise technos like the things you can't see like he does he's really good at doing that so it sets everyone off it sets all the cops off but then Sully he does the final the finale of the act he uses his roar to scare the living crap out of the cops after they've been riled up riled up riled up and with all of those screams not only does the canister in the like for the door that's meant to be open, go all the way up. It actually fills up all the empty canisters in the room, scaring the Dean out of her wits because she has never experienced anything like that before. So once the cops leave, like scared out of their wits, Mike says, okay, let's go. Because he knows that with that amount of screaming that it had to open the door because I think they shown a light like o over the door that would lead them home. And um, because they basically overpowered all of the canisters in the room, especially the one that like keeps the door open, Mike and Sully escape the human world, go back to the university and the door just completely explodes. Again, I don't know how that works, don't ask me. But with Mike's tenacity in how he knows how to scare, he assisted Sully to actually get into the scare and that's proof that Sully is a worthy scare between the two. And of course, um, the, with the conclusion of the movie, the both of them end up getting expelled because they did the thing that basically ruined the school's reputation by sneaking into the human world, like, without permission. It ends up being a good ending for everyone because, again, as Mike and Sully are leaving, Sully's telling Mike that basically he Mike is, like super smart like he's very good at planning he is very good at doing the background work and he knows that mike is going to be super successful unlike sully himself who even self-admits that he had gotten through life so easy based on a name that when he even got to the school that he was basically seen as a failure to everyone to which mike's like that's not like that's not true like you're very good at the scare thing and sully um, yeah sully's like not as good as you are. Like, you may not be scary physically. Not one bit. But you are the most fearless monster I've ever seen. And eventually, and it shows in the credits of the film, that basically Mike and Sully do end up working at Monsters, Inc. Because Mike's like, looking at the newspaper, well, you know what they say? There's always the mailroom. So the two of them um, start working in the mailroom and Mike is, has, of course, the dreams of grandeur again. He's like, just imagine this. The most mail sent in the entire company. And again, like, you're getting close to the credits and it posts pictures of their journey leading up to how they are in the first movie, which Mike is the scare coach for Sully and Sully is the scare going into the human world. And we realize that, yes, no... Mike is not a talented scarer in the physical sense, but he had definitely made it work for Sully to be successful. And that is where Mike sees his success. And that's why in the first movie, like even for the little things, Mike has become a lot more grateful because he has Sully, his now new best friend, to tell him that, like, there are so many, like, other things that you are good at. And I am jealous of you because of it. Like, I wish that I studied more just like you because you're the most dedicated person I've ever met. And because Mike has been dedicated to his work, he and Sully have become the duo of the Monsters Incorporated company. I love how this movie ends on a positive note. Like, it doesn't show that Mike was a failure in this aspect, so he was going to be a failure in all aspects. Well, of course, 
it being a prequel to the first Monsters, Inc. movie, you have to explain how they got to work at Monsters Incorporated in the first place. But I love that basically, like, even though you're not going to get what you want directly, there are things you could do that will take you up to something that's just as successful. Which, of course, Mike does get end up getting. He ends up getting his dream of working at Monsters Incorporated. It wasn't in the way that he expected, but it was the way that it was meant to be intended. Which, he ends up super happy because he did end up getting his dream. But he also is now working in a position that he's also very proud to work in. And that is not shameful. To have a dream and you think it should go this way, but if it turns out it doesn't go in the way that you had intended and you had to take another route, there is nothing shameful in that. It doesn't mean that someone is a flop or someone is a failure in said aspects. It just means that maybe the way you intended was not the way that it could probably go. And that is okay. And getting critiqued on things that you're not good at, that doesn't, that's, even though you're constantly are getting critiqued on it, like what I said in my example about exams, it's not that, oh, they're telling you intentionally that you're just bad at this, or they hate you for some reason or another. That's not what it universally means. It just universally means there's just things that could be improved. And then there are some things that are like, okay, maybe you're not good at this, but have you tried doing it this way? Have you tried solving the problem this way? And your bosses, your teachers, your parents, they're going to have you work to solve this, solve the problem because as you get older, you're going to have to figure out these problems for yourself. Like there's not going to be a clear answer to the problem you're trying trying to solve or to this thing that you got critiqued on. So how do you approve with the critique in mind? And when you're an adult, especially when you're an adult and now that you're in the working field, your bosses are not going to always provide you with a solution. Like, you have to ask for these solutions, or not solution per se, but like you have to ask for how to improve or help assistance on how to improve. The problem with this like fit, like juggernaut of a music industry is that there are not a lot of opportunities for people to improve, which goes back to what I said about the second gen idol who said, training does not stop the day you debut because there's going to be new things that are going to come your way and you're going to have to be ready to adapt to those new things. You're going to have to improve on the things that you might not have been good at at first because if you don't do those things, time is going to bite you in the butt later and you're going to end up looking like a fool afterwards. And unfortunately with so many fans and so many people most likely teenagers like you who are watching this or young people in general who are probably watching this, probably you hate my face right now because I'm spewing words that you don't like. Like, I'm gonna, I'm not the first person to um, come up with this resolution that I know this video is gonna get down votes because I'm not saying the easy answers of like, oh yeah, hate exists, everyone's a hater. Yes, there are going to be haters out there, but let me tell you, they are going to be the absolute minority of people that you're going to come across in real life. Because haters in reality, they hate because it's easy. It's because they don't want to look at their own, like, not flaws, but like the things that they're not good at themselves. And because they don't know how to word it or fix it in their own way, they just attack other people because it makes them temporarily feel better. Yes, some of those people are going to exist. But what you have to understand is that when people are giving criticism in your life or critique adjacent to someone else that you quote unquote care about, it's not because they want to see you or this celebrity that you like fail. In fact, the majority of the time that is never the case. Because most of the time, 
critiques are written like this for the person reading it to hopefully come up with a solution on how to fix the problem that are listed in the critiques and basically prove the critic wrong that no, I'm not going to like sit in my room and cry over this one comment that I'm probably not going to read tomorrow. I'm going to go to work tomorrow and figure out how I can fix this. How can I improve this so I can prove to everyone that I am worth being in this industry, that I am worth the artist that people like me for. At least that's how I hope most celebrities, especially performers, whether that's singers, dancers, rappers, whatever, would take it. But as we all know, celebrities are very fickle people and they don't like being told that they're wrong. Like if Sakura of La Seraphim was proof of anything, like she was the one I believe who wrote the comments of like, oh, like the Coachella performance, like was not good or something because um, we were, well, what was what she said? Okay, so looks like this article from The Times has the only like direct quotes that um, Sakura had on basically people um, criticizing the uh, Coachella performance. Um, we, when talking about La Seraphim, who debuted less than two years ago and have only toured once, stood proudly on the Coachella stage, enjoyed ourselves and gave our all to this performance. That alone made it truly a day that defines both life and La Seraphim for me. Fear not, you too will face many challenges and injustices in your life, but only you truly know what you have done. I seriously prepared for this stage, struggled through it, and enjoyed it. On the day of the show, I believe I was able to show everything. To some eyes, it might appear immature, but no one is perfect for everyone, and that is an undeniable fact. Among all the stages we have shown, this was the best. That's why I'm excited to become a better team and I really want to work harder. Okay, so after reading that, on paper, it's exactly as if how I described it earlier. It's like, yes, they were preparing for the show very hard and I have no doubts that La Seraphim were doing the best they could for Coachella because Coachella is a huge festival. We all know this. At the same time though, I don't know if um, that was the whole thing that she sent. Well, basically um, what she said was, um, among all the stages we've shown, this one was the best. Now, I've tr watched um, the, uh, the live show stuff with Music Bank, um, Inky Gaio, whatever those um, sh award shows are that they do, like on a, what is a weekly basis. I've seen them do pretty bad encores when they've won um, awards for, one of them was Unforgiven, and the other was for Easy, I believe. That's the more recent single. And I can easily say they were not good because I think you could tell they were unprepared to be doing that in the first place. I don't know, it's as if like Hype told them that, oh, you might not win this and that's all right or whatever. So you don't really have to like prepare that you do, even though at these like music shows, like it's pretty much knowledge that every single time like someone wins an award at the end of the night, you have to give an encore performance. Like that's been a thing for ever. Like, or as long as, like, um, those shows have, have concerned, that's been, like, the thing for her. So how do they not know that this might happen? I mean, true, you're not going to know if you're going to win something on the, on the performance or not. But at the end of the day, these encore performances exist for a reason. They want to see why you won this award. And I know it's a fan vote sort of thing, so not all of them are going to be accurate. But at the end of the day... The reason why you're showing off is that you want to show your audience why you think you deserve this award. And if you're doing that by showing like the most god awful vocals possible, yeah, people are gonna give you the side eye. People are gonna like cock their eyebrows and be like, what the fuck was that? And the thing about Co Coachella too is that yes, it's a music festival. And yes, festival settings are weird because acoustics are going to be awkward. Everyone's going to be screaming. So it's going to be hard to hear people sometimes. 
But, and I think on camera, they don't show everything. I would agree to that. Because on camera, even like, like just hearing everything on that is going to be awkward out. But I've seen some pretty good, like, camera work from, like, cameras that were, like, closer to the front of the stage. Or even not close to the stage, but they got a pretty good view and got pretty good sound of how the girls sounded like. I would admit that they did what they could with the dancing aspect because I know the Coachella stage is very... I don't want to say weird, but it's very specific, so maybe it's not able to supply what they could do all the time. Because, like I said, it's a music festival, so a lot of the time, music festivals, especially of their caliber, they're more focused on the vocal aspect a lot, or basically on the music in general. I know in Coachella, a lot of bands come to perform, so most people are going to be more pay- more so paying attention to the actual songs themselves, and I think that's the issue that people have with Sakura's co- comments. Because even though what she said about trying super hard is true, in terms of how to perform on a stage like that, first of all, Hybe should have prepared. Doesn't Hybe know what Coachella is by now? A couple of K-pop artists have performed at Coachella at this point. So I think they, or at least those in the companies might know, or have done their research by this point, what type of festival Coachella is. It's not really known for dancing visuals or if it is there are very specific artists who have made that work if i'm trying to remember correctly i don't i know harry styles is a very like visual kind of artist who also has a really good voice and i don't think even he did that much in terms of like like visually showing off what he could do like how he does in music videos and in concerts But then again, people really praised his performance. Like, I don't think I've seen any negative comments about Harry Styles' Coachella, unless it's about his outfit, but people complain about his clothes anyway. But when it comes- I think when it comes to La Seraphim's case, they had the very unfortunate, um, circumstance of being more of a dance group, which dancing they do very well, although I'm not gonna talk about Smarter until later, but that's pretty on the point. Like, in terms of their dance and their stage presence, I think they do the job. However, remember, this is a musical performance. People are going to expect you to sing at these. And if you can't do the singing well, no matter how hard you try, if you can't do the singing well, people are going to call out on it. And that's exactly what they did. That's exactly what people did. They called her out and all of them out on how their singing was not up to par. Like, you can tell they were not prepared for a stage setting like that. Like, most of the time, it sounds like the girls are straining their vocal cords, especially to hit high notes on stage. And hitting high notes very loud is incredibly hard, which is why you have a microphone in your hand most of the time. But you can tell even then they're not... They were just not... So, unless I missed something in this article and I couldn't find um, the original what she said at all... It sounds like she was basically avoiding the fact that maybe there were some things that they have missed. And Sakura was basically trying to give the excuse of like, oh, we were trying and you can't blame us for trying. To which I'm like, you're in the professional music business now. If you make a mistake during your performance and people call you out on it, you have to give some form of why, like, there was no excuse for what we did. Just that we thought we were ready, but we're not. And I think maybe she kinda said that in here. But then she says, to some eyes, it might appear immature. Who are the some eyes, Sakura? That's what I want to ask. And then she says, but no one is perfect for everyone. I think Prince and Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston might attest to that, but I but I digress. Or Dolly Parton too, like Dolly Parton might attest to that, but whatever. So I don't know how to feel about this. Or I don't know how to feel about what she said, except that it sounded like she was trying to avoid the issue. And again, I don't, I don't think it was an interview in which she said this. I think it was just on her private social media based on what I could find. And, um, some people were correct when they saw this, when they said that Sakura could, should have just 
I don't know, kept that to herself. Because as a celebrity, you, like, yes, you're going to feel, like, human emotions, like, everyone's human. But in the case of now that everyone has your eyes on you, like, even if you just write a, like, emotional release rant or, like, self-reflection thing on your social media, whether that's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever... Everyone's going to see that, and they're gonna, kind of going to judge who you are based on what you put on your own social media. So if you're going off saying, like, being all like, oh, I tried, but it was never good enough, to which I'm also like, Sakura, were you also in Eyes 1? Like, weren't you also in, like, a temp group that you basically won in a competition to get, like, a couple years ago? Like... I feel like she should have been prepared for this. And I think, if I remember correctly, Sakura was a part of AKB48 or one of those subgroups. I don't remember which one. Like, I'm sorry. So, and if the, I know anything about um, AKB48, it's that, yes, I do like AKB48. I do like their songs. I do like some of their songs. But do I go to them to find um, good vocals and good um, artistry? artists no unless they do something extremely extraordinary that i find out later like unless they do something that piques my interests like that is very rare that is extremely rare of me so i'm thinking that she's basically i don't know indirectly using her inexperience from akb48 as kind of an excuse for why like oh some people are not gonna get her and i'm like Look, if it was the typical, like, J-pop girl group part-time thing, then yes, like, J-pop stands are going to be more understandable because they researched to what kind of industry it is. I've been a fan of J-pop for a long while. I understand how some of it works, and there are some things that I don't. But do I take that as an excuse for when you're trying to enter a... I don't want to say more legit because now I'm going to say, like, oh, J-pop's not legit. No. That's not what I'm saying. Like, when you're trying to enter, I guess, the more mainstream, when people worldwide are expecting you, like, if people are saying that you're the best thing since sliced bread, if people are like, oh, the they're the best girl group because they can sing, they can dance, they can do whatever, then if they're telling that to other people, then other people are going to come to your music expecting you to do the things that other people have been telling them about. And if you can't perform like that, yeah, they're going to say something. And you can't, like, write stuff like that. Like, expecting people to be to sympathize with you. That kind of reminds me when um, Jenny did her interview on um, Dua Lipa's podcast. And um, she basically was saying, um, oh, like, I injured inter myself a lot. And um, I learned a lot of things about, like, how I should treat my body and stuff like that. To which I'm like... Okay, yeah, I understand, like, yeah, when you injure yourself, you do have to, like, learn to take care of your body more. I respect that. But how does that apply to you not performing well on stage when you're not injured? Because it's very clear, it was, or it was very clear to the audience that during that Blackpink tour that occurred, like, last year, that you didn't care much about performing on stage until you got to Los Angeles because that's where all your friends are at and you want to show them, oh, I can't perform. I just, when I'm not in LA, like if I'm in like, I don't know, Chicago or like buttfuck nowhere, Virginia or wherever it is they went to go perform at. I think it was a huge tour too. Like it was a giant tour. Like I think they went, I, I don't know if they had two shows in Texas. I could be talking out of my ass, but Basically, when, from what I understood from people who actually went to the show, because yes, I did look at the comments of people who actually bought tickets and physically went to the concerts, and there were a lot of people who did. They said, like, when, if it was not a major, major city, like New York or Los Angeles, as I said earlier, if it wasn't those cities, yes, they're, like, Blackpink's performances, especially Jenny, were really bad. And I believe them. Because I do believe that, I mean, I kind of think this is what industry plants do anyway. Like, they won't try their best when it doesn't matter to them. But when they go to these cities where, of course, they're 
giant like celebrity like music hotspots. Like New York is a popular music hotspot. I think Atlanta is a huge like music hotspot. Los Angeles, because it's Hollywood and whatever, huge hotspot. Of course they're going to do better because they think, oh, my friends or like some famous person is going to watch me in the audience. So I have to perform for them. They're not, they're not performing for you. They're performing for them. But anyway, I did not mean to get on a black pink tangent, but that still pisses me off. But what I'm trying to say is like, this is what happens, like the whole soccer thing. This is what happens when you don't hold your artists like work ethic accountable. Because if you just tell them that everything about them is perfect, they're not going to be motivated to get better. This is why that second gen idol said, like, you have to keep educating yourself all the time because if you don't, you're gonna end up being held back. This is what she meant. Because if you have people like yes men in your ear, basically saying, oh, you're always perfect. You don't have to do this. I mean, yes, you don't have to. Like no one is forcing you to make improvements while at the same time, if you want to accomplish that thing, you have to make some form of change. Because if people are always going, like say you're like working at an office job for a job, like just in general, if your boss tells you that, um, let's just say like your, um, your job is like, you have to process um, 200 checks a day and you have to make sure like these 200 checks are all correct and they're going to the same place. I'm just making up a scenario. So you do the 200 checks and you come and your boss like comes to you the next day and you said, and they say, oh, thank you for processing these 200 checks. However, we did notice that when you printed these out, there were a couple of discrepancies on some of these checks. I wanted to ask you why there were discrepancies, but even though I asked you to check them. Like as a person working there, your response would be, oh, I'm sorry, I must have overlooked. Like, I promise I will do better in making sure that everything's right. I will pace myself. I will make sure that these are right the next time. You And your boss will be like, well, they won't tell you, but they're gonna be like, thank you, and then walk away. But you just can't tell your boss, oh, I don't know, I, mean, I did exactly what you said. You can't bring that negativity to the table because then your boss is gonna look at you and they're gonna be like, oh, you're one of those, huh? Like, and yes, there's going to be like maybe one misstep sometimes. And it's human to do that. But what I'm saying is if you keep doing the same mistake, like what if what happens the next day you, you ignore the advice and then more checks get overlooked with wrong information on them. If your boss sees that you're not improving and basically you're doing everything wrong each and every day on those 200 checks, they're gonna have no choice but then to fire you because they could hire someone else who would actually take the criticism better than you can. Because that's how the real world works. And with K-pop especially, there's new competition coming into the industry every day. There's new groups coming in every day and you're going to compete with these newer groups who may or may not have performers more prepared for what's coming or who knows, maybe we might have, I don't know, a new girl's generation coming in. Maybe a new like Blackpink who actually can perform better or a new version of you, like not in the literal sense, but like in a figurative, like figurative, um, success and talent wise like thing in their own way that's what i'm trying to say if that group comes along and basically out sells you or out beats you in every single category that you claim to have that's gonna look worse on you who doesn't admit that you might have a problem than you just taking the criticism and then once that criticism is taken and you're actually taking your job seriously, you might see improvements up ahead. Now, like I said, time is very fickle and we don't know what these people, celebrities are thinking. We don't know what these idols are thinking. So maybe they do take the criticism and we do see idols who do take that criticism and they do get better. There are many um, reviewers I've seen who have noted that and they've always taken a chance to note people's improvements and those are the people I actually appreciate on this channel actually because that means 
I'm not going to, like, look at them once and then just completely ignore them until, like, something big happens. No, that means, like, okay, I've said my criticism thing, and now I'm going to see if they actually follow through. And most of the time they do. And that's great. Yeah, I think I've spoken about this long enough. I don't need to beat people over the head with this. But at the same time, I always like ending these videos like on a high higher note. And that higher note is it's not the end of the world for any of these people, really. So we shouldn't be taking all these criticisms directly to the heart. And we especially should not be taking all these quote unquote hate wagon comments seriously. Because at the end of the day, when the future comes around, those hate comments are not going to matter. Like they're just going to be that. Words. Words that you read on your phone screen. Words that are spewed on TikTok. Like TikTok, I don't know if TikTok would even exist in 10 years. I don't know. But let's end this with a little Mufasa quote that I like. Look inside yourself, Simba. You are more than what you have become. And that's right. You're always going to be more than what you are now. And what you are now will end up changing. Maybe it'll be by a little, maybe it'll be by a lot. Who knows? But at the end of the day, like what you're good at and what you might not be good at, they're not definitive. They're not permanent. And like I said, for some of these people out there that you admire, sometimes they're going to change and maybe they might not change, but it all depends on how they take it. And how they take it is not your responsibility. You're not their parent, you're not their sibling, you don't even know them. And if they do change for the better, that's great. It's always going to be great. And who's to be jealous of that? Nobody. But and it, seriously too, like nobody is making these critiques on these people because we're jealous. Because most of the time we, we critics have better things to do with our day than to constantly watch this person breathe. Yeah, let's just get that out of the way. But going back to the positive thing, there's always room in your life to improve on something or to find the thing that you're good at and stick with it. We are all young. Time is not gonna steal our youth from us. It's not like, oh, you're not good at something that it's always gonna be that way or or you're not good at that one thing, like you're a failure of a person, no. There is no such thing as an individual being a failure in their own right. There's always a thing as room for improvement and room to grow. And whether that room to grow involves that one thing that maybe you're struggling with or not, it reminds us that we should take this time to look at the problem that we might have and we make the two choices or one of the two choices. Do we find the solution for the problem regardless of maybe how long it might take to get that problem to be fixed? Or are we going to keep spewing the same insanity rhetoric that, oh, it's not me, it's you? Remember, those two choices are never gonna go away. As humans, it'll always be those two choices that'll ring like speech bubbles above our heads in an RPG game, telling you, should you make choice A or choice B? There's always going to be one answer that's gonna be more productive than the other. So with that said, I think I'm done ruining my vocal cords for today. And thank you for watching me ramble on for two hours about something that who knows, maybe you're not gonna take this at face value today, tomorrow, next week, next month, or even next year. But I do hope that some people would think about this later and be like, hmm, maybe I should make, or maybe I should think about making either of those two decisions myself. I'm Kate Sheeran, it's been real. Ciao.